25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he shall sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you, for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, and you, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly, I say to you, to the extent you did it to the least of, my, least of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say also to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which was prepared for the devil and his, and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. And you did not clothe me, sick in prison, you did not visit me. Then they themselves will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? And he will answer to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent which you did this, the least did not do this, the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away to eternal punishment, but the right, righteous to eternal life. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for all your all your gifts, Lord. Uh, most most thankful for we are for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who, Lord, we know died for us to pay for our sins, Lord. But we also thank you for your scriptures, Lord, knowing that they're the only reliable method. Uh, access we have to the truth, Lord. If your scriptures say them, it is absolutely true if it was in the original writings, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for it, and we thank you, Lord, for all the gifts that you get. And uh, for right now, Lord, I ask that you bless my words, that I can speak your truth accurately, Lord, and that you bless the people here, Lord, so they can hear your truth, Lord. And Lord, if I say anything that is not in accordance with your word, I ask you to cause these people to forget it as though I'd never said it. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been speaking of hermeneutics. That is the art and science of interpreting messages, but in this case, scripture. The art and science of interpreting scripture. Two weeks ago, I spoke about hermeneutics and prophecy. Uh, last week, Jeff spoke of an inter a, a, a grammatical historical interpretive method. Today, we're going to demonstrate, you know, this method on a very difficult passage. We're going to use the various forms of context to find out the author's real meaning. Remember what we said, that, or what Jeff was talking about last week, that you have to understand the context to understand the message. Now, we're going to divide it up into a couple different kinds of context today, but using context, you can, you can avoid serious errors in your own personal study. Now, today we'll be looking at three layers of context. First, historical context, because everything has a history. Everything on earth has a history. There was a time when Peter, Paul, Jeremiah, Moses sat down and wrote something. Now, they were using the language they grew up with. And since none of us here grew up speaking Hebrew or Greek or any of those things, we need you know, help getting to that. Uh, and also, the, not just their, their written language, but also the communication tools. You guys ever tried to teach English to somebody not from America? You know, like the little metaphors, the little, you know, all the, the tools of language beyond the language itself. Okay, that's all part of the historical context. Another type of context we're going to be looking at is literary context. The style of literature. The style of literature. You don't read a cake recipe searching for political truth, do you? That's an, that's an example of style of literature. Also, the purpose of the author in writing. Why did the author write as part of literary context? And finally, grammatical context. Now that's the structure of the actual sentence and also the passage right before it and sometimes right after it. It also touches to the literal dictionary definition meaning of the words. Now that can be the denotated meaning, which means the dictionary meaning, or the connotated meaning, 
the cultural meaning attached to that word. We're going to study all those types of contexts as they relate to this passage. Now, the text we've chosen today is Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. Now, as we go through it, we're going to be seeing some erroneous interpretations. Some erroneous interpretations. Errors are a possibility for anyone. That includes Jeff and myself. As I said two weeks ago, and as Jeff repeated last week, neither one of us are apostles or prophets. Now, I know that has you guys disturbed because you're used to us having the authoritative truth that is unquestionable, but neither one of us have that authority. We can be wrong, too. We can be wrong, too. So you need to be able to check out what we're saying. That's why you have the scriptures. That is why hundreds of, and hundreds and hundreds of years have gone into preparing, you to ha or preparing for you to have the scriptures. They were written over the course of two and a half thousand years, and they were done 1,900 years ago, or a little more than 1,900 years ago. And they've, been, they've gone through a long struggle so that you can have access to them. We're blessed today by having readily available translations of the scripture that you guys can have, plus all of the tools that we have. But even that, errors are a possibility for anyone. That is why we need to know the scriptures. We need to know them. Because scripture itself warns us that false teachers will arrive. The Apostle Peter says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. False teachers, according to Peter, will arise. I tell you now they have arisen. We need to, to understand God's word clearly in a way that we can check out what somebody says about it. Because people will lie to you. Or they might be wrong themselves. You need to be able to check them out. And this is a way to do it. Understanding the context of what's written explains a lot about what's written. Other things about that passage. False teachers will arise amongst believers. Just because somebody is standing up here, that could be Jeff, that could be me, that could be anybody else who's standing here or at any other pulpit in the world, or any other platform in the world, or write, written any book in the world, they can be wrong. The only thing that cannot be wrong is the scripture. Hmm. So we need to be on their guard because these people are not going to stand up there and say, hey, I'm a false teacher. Don't believe what I'm saying. I'm a false teacher. They're not going to do that. They're not going to be wearing a big t-shirt that says false teacher. You have to be able to check them out because people will lie to you. People will be wrong. I could be wrong. Jeff can be wrong. You can be wrong too. We need to be able to check these things out. We need to be on our guard. We need to be armed with the sword of the spirit, which as Paul says, is the word of God. We need to know how to use that. And to go back to Paul's example in Ephesians, when he's talking about the soldier armed with the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and all of that, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, if you put a soldier on the battlefield with a sword and he doesn't know how to use it, what's going to happen to him? Is he going to be an effective soldier? No, we need to know how to use the sword. That's what this sermon is about. Okay, to learn how to use that sword. Now, as I said before, the first type of context is the historical context. And with the historical context, you start with the author. Who is the author? If that is knowable, you should start there. Now in this case, the author is the Apostle Matthew, the eyewitness Apostle Matthew. Now his original name was Levi. Levi. He was a tax collector. And if you remember, we talk, we've talked about Matthew before, and we always talked about how tax collectors, harlots, were all, and sinners were all grouped into the same, same category.